Welcome to Chapter 45, Animal Movement. Whoa, 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 whoa. Okay, dog, calm down there. All right, by the end of this chapter, you should be able to describe the molecular changes that occur during muscle contraction and relaxation. Compare and contrast smooth muscle, cardiac muscle, and skeletal muscle. Compare and contrast the structure and function of hydrostatic skeletons, endoskeletons, and exoskeletons. And describe the process by which animals locomote. And compare and contrast animal locomotion, locomotion on land, in water, and in air. Um, okay, so muscles. Um, invertebrate skeletal and cardiac muscle tissue is made of these long slender cells called muscle fibers, which we talked about a little bit. So if you look at a muscle, it's made up of muscle tissue, and within each muscle fiber are lots of these little thread-like contractile structures called myofibrils. Okay, so here's your muscle tissue, and if you look up close, you see a bundle of many muscle fibers. So these are many cells bundled together. And then if you take out a single cell, okay, so it's one cell, and it's made up of many myofibrils. If you take out a single myofibril, it looks like this. It's kind of striped like this, okay? And so the myofibrils have these alternating light-dark units called sarcomeres. Okay, so we have a light band with a line in the middle, dark band, light band, and so one area from light to dark to light is a sarcomere, okay? Um, when the muscle contracts, um, basically the, well, the whole thing's contracting, including the myofibril is contracting and becoming smaller, and then the sarcomere will become shorter. And then when the sarcomere relaxes, um, when other things are stretching the muscle, it'll lengthen again, and the myofibril will be longer, and the muscle will be lengthened. All right, so the smallest contractile unit in the skeletal muscle is what? Well, the bands are smaller than the sarcomere. The myofibril is the biggest. All right, those things are all true. Are the bands um, a unit? No, they're part of a unit. And what's the unit made up of the two light bands and the dark band? That's a sarcomere. Yeah, it's a sarcomere. Okay, so the sarcomere, if you look at it up close, so here's our, again our sarcomere, light, dark light. It's made up of two types of proteins, thick filaments and thin filaments. So the thin filaments are made out of the protein actin. Looks like this. It's kind of like um, a string of beads, and then there's two strings wound around each other. And then the thick filament is myosin, and it kind of looks like a golf club, but it's like a whole bunch of golf clubs stuck together. All right. So the thin filaments, like I said, are two coiled chains of the globular protein actin, and then one end of each, each thin filament is bound to a structure called a Z-disc over here. So that's what you're seeing, this dark band here and here, is the Z-disc, okay? And then the end wall of the sarcomere um, is what is anchoring the filament, okay? And the other end of the thin filament is free to interact with the thick filament. Okay, so this end here is loose. It's not really attached to anything, but it can move back and forth along the thick filament. So the thick filaments are composed of multiple strands of, like I said, myosin, which is kind of in the shape of these little golf clubs. Um, <clears throat> so when the sarcomere is relaxed, you can see that um, the actin is, is like this, and then the myosin is over in this part of the actin. When the muscle is contracted, um, and the sarcomere is contracted, you can see that the little um, molecules of myosin have worked their way down here, right, inside the strand of actin, like this. So that's what the, what the sarcomere looks like when it's contracted, and this is what it looks like when it's relaxed. Okay, so you can kind of see it going on here. So here's your um, Z-disc, and then here's your actin, and here is your myosin. So you can see the myosin are kind of scrunching their way down the actin when the muscle contracts, and then when it's relaxed, they're loosened up. All right, so what is ATP? It's the molecule that makes cells run. Yeah, what does it stand for? Adenosine triphosphate. Yeah, adenosine triphosphate. So what's the triphosphate? It's triphosphates. Yeah. So what's hydrolysis mean? It means breaking with water. Yeah. So when we talked about hydrolysis of macromolecules, what did that mean? 
It's when you break them into smaller, littler molecules. Yeah. So does the hydrolysis of ATP into ADP require energy or release energy? It releases energy! Okay. All right, so um, this is a close-up of a, a molecule of myosin. Looks like a golf club. Um, myosin contains a pair of subunits whose tails are coiled around one another and whose heads are bent to the side. So here's the heads and then the tails are all coiled around each other. Um, so the myosin head is bound to the actin molecule and when this happens it catalyzes the hydrolysis of the ATP, meaning it causes the ATP to be broken into ADP plus phosphate. So if you have an animal that's dead with rigor mortis and its muscles are all stiff and locked up, um, this has happening because the myosin and the actin are locked up together. Um, the, the animal's dead, right? So there's no new ATP being made, so ATP is unavailable. And so you would need to add ATP for myosin to release actin, but no ATP is coming. All right, so the interaction between actin and myosin as the muscle contracts is a four-step process. So you remember you saw that little little video where the myosin heads are kind of scrunching down the filament of actin. So let's look at that in more detail. So um, the first thing that happens, this is, this is kind of the relaxed state here. So you have the myosin head is bound to the thin filament of actin, okay? All right, first an ATP molecule will bind to the myosin head right here. When ATP binds to the head of the myosin, it causes the myosin head to be kind of cocked back like this, okay? Um, and when that happens, the head of the myosin is released from the thin filament of actin. All right, so then when the ATP is broken into ADP plus phosphate, that causes the myosin head to straighten out and the neck to pivot in this direction. Um, and so then the myosin head will bind down to um, so it started out over here, but then when it bound the second time, it bound over here. So it's further down on the thin filament. Um, and then the myosin head um, becomes, let's see, uh, cocked, right? So it's ready to be able to um, to be able to move the actin, move along the actin filament, because then when it releases the phosphate. Um, the neck will bend back into its original shape. So this is this kind of bent shape. And then I know it's less bent than it normally is, but this is like, it's kind of stretched in this weird, you know, kind of straightened position. And then when the phosphate is released, sproying, it goes back into its normal shape again. Um, and so when that happens, when the head goes back to its normal shape, it scrunches down along the thin filament. Okay. And then... Finally, the ADP is released, and so then this little unit is available again, and it's ready to bind to another ATP molecule. So again, you know, it starts out like this, ATP binds to it, um, and then the AD ATP is broken into phosphate plus ADP, um, which gives it energy, which causes it to kind of bend backwards in this weird shape, and then um, the phosphate is released, and then it bounces back to its original shape like this, so it's scrunching down this way on the thin filament and then the ADP leaves. So it just is doing that over and over and over again. Um, so this is just kind of showing that happening. Um, you should also note that the thin filament here, we just showed it as being these two kind of purple beads, right? But they contain also two other molecules called troponin and tropomyosin proteins, and these can block the myosin binding sites on the actin, okay? So here comes the myosin head, and it tries to bind to the actin, but there might be um, there might be troponin blocking its way. Okay, so when the myosin binding sites on the actin are blocked, um, you can't get that interaction between myosin and actin, and that causes the muscle to relax. So when you have calcium ions that get in there and they bind to the troponin, um, the resulting troponin tropomyosin complex moves, and it exposes the myosin binding site, and you can have a contraction. Um, so this is a way in which when we talk about calcium ions coming in and um, allowing muscle contractions to start, this is a way in which they can do that. If you release a bunch of calcium ions, they get in there, they mess with the troponin, and then that makes it possible for the myosin to bind to the actin. All right, so when ATP binds to a myosin head, 
what happens? Does the head of the myosin straighten and the head pivots to the cocked position? Does the myosin head become released from the actin thin filament? Does the myosin bind tightly to actin, leading to a state known as rigor mortis? Or does the myosin head undergo the power stroke? Oh no. What? I don't know the answer. Well, can you eliminate some answers? Well, we know that the myosin head, okay, it's not the one with the power stroke, and it's not the one with the rigor mortis. Okay. So when the ATP binds to the myosin head, what does it do? I think it releases from the actin thin filament. I think that, that the neck of the myosin gets cocked when it gets hydrolyzed. Yep, you're right. So when the ATP binds to the myosin head, that is when the myosin head gets picked up from the actin thin filament. All right, so there's three types of vertebrate muscle tissues, smooth, cardiac, and skeletal. And I think we talked about this a little a couple chapters ago. We talked about the idea that some muscles are voluntary, meaning that we can consciously use our, our you know, thoughts and brains to um, direct their motion, right? Um, involuntary muscles contract only in response to unconscious electrical activity and um, are stimulated and inhibited by neurons in the autonomic division. Um, another way that muscles differ from each other is some are multinucleate, meaning they have multiple nuclei, and others are uninucleate. Some muscles are striated, and some muscles are unstriated. All right, so um, these are the muscle classes in vertebrates. So you have a smooth muscle that looks like this, and it has a single nucleus per muscle cell. It doesn't have striations or lines on it, and it doesn't branch. You don't see any sarcomeres. You tend to find it in intestines and arteries, and so it does things like move food and help regulate blood pressure, and it's involved in involuntary activity, okay? So you don't need any kind of a signal to set it off. All right, so the cardiac muscle is striated, so it has these lines on it. It has one or two nuclei per cell. The cells branch, and um, they contain sarcomeres, like we talked about. But cardiac muscle is also involuntary, meaning that you can't start and stop your heart, right? All right, and then finally, skeletal muscle is also multinucleate, and it's striated, it's not branched, and it contains sarcomeres. And this is involved, this is basically attached to the skeleton and moves the skeleton. And so this is um, our voluntary muscle that we use to flex and just do the things we do to get through life. So which of the following muscle types is unbranched, unstriated, and contains a single nu nucleus and is involuntary? Smooth muscle! Smooth muscle? Yeah, smooth muscle. Yep, that's the right answer. All right, so there are three types of skeletal muscle fibers. Um, there are slow muscle fibers, and so if you look at them under a microscope, they're going to appear red um, because they have iron-bound oxygen in the myoglobin, myoglobin. They tend to contract very slowly because the myosin hydrolyzes ATP, meaning it turns ATP into ADP plus P at a very slow rate, and um, it tends to fatigue very slowly because there's a high concentration of mitochondria in these cells. Okay, so these are sometimes called slow twitch muscles. Okay, so they fatigue, it takes, um, they're kind of slow to move, but they fatigue very slowly. Fast muscle fibers, if you look at them, they appear white because they have a very low concentration of myoglobin. They can contract very rapidly because the myosin um, hydrolyzes ATP rapidly, but they fatigue very easily because the main source of ATP is glycolysis, um, not cellular respiration. And then finally, you have intermediate muscle fibers, and those usually appear kind of pinkish or red, and they're intermediate between slow and fast fibers. Um, and so you get kind of an intermediate level of fatigue, they're intermediate fast, and they get ATP from both glycolysis and aerobic respiration. So you find those three different kinds of fiber types in all skeletal muscles, but the relative abundance of each muscle fiber type is going to be differ, different from cell to cell. So, um, or I'm sorry, from muscle to muscle. So slow fibers tend to find, you tend to find slow fibers in the muscles that are specialized for endurance, and you tend to find fast fibers um, 
in muscles that are used for bursts of activity. And so one thing that um, you should know if you're interested in exercise is that as a human, you can increase the density of mitochondria and myoglo myoglobin, as well as the number of blood vessels um, by, you know, kind of working out and doing things to enable increased, um, you know, kind of to increase those things to allow yourself increased performance. But you cannot change muscle, um, skeletal muscle fibers from slow to fast fibers or vice versa. The fibers just are what they are. All right, so there are three types of skeletal systems, which we've talked about before. You can have a hydrostatic skeleton that is using the hydrostatic pressure of some enclosed, enclosed body fluid or soft tissue to support the body. So for example, in each segment of a worm, um, there's a fixed quantity of fluid and the worm can alternate between uh, flexing the muscles that go around the outside of each segment to make each, to make each segment long and skinny and then um, flexing the muscles that run the length of each segment to make each segment short and fat. And so that's the way that a worm can move by peristalsis. All right, endoskeletons are rigid structures inside the body, the body like bones, and vertebrate skeletons move by changing the angle of joints. So we have some muscles that are known as flexors that pull the bones, these two bones closer together. Um, so it de decreases the angle of the joint between them. And then you have extensors that increase the angle of a joint by straightening it out. You can also have an organism with an exoskeleton, like an insect, that have rigid structures on the outside of the body, but they also have flexors and extensors. They're just attached to the inside. Um, and so all of the muscles have to be packed inside of the skeleton. And in order for the animal to get bigger and to have larger muscles, uh, the exoskeleton has to be shed or molted. All right, so hopefully you've learned a lot about the nervous system, muscle contraction, muscles, tissues, skeletal systems, and locomotion. We talked about smooth cardiac and skeletal muscle tissues and hydrostatic exoskeleton and endoskeleton skeletal systems. You know, we did not talk about locomotion on land, water, or air, so don't worry about that part.